Uh, one of my favourite films is The Shawshank Redemption from 1994, and no doubt many of us have seen it here. They tell the moving story of a man called Andy Dufresne. He's a banker who's wrongly convicted of his wife's murder and imprisoned in the notorious Shawshank State Prison. Its major theme is about the power of hope, and despite serving two life sentences with no prospect of parole, Andy never loses hope that one day he will finally taste freedom. And this sense of destiny that he has transforms his life in prison. Throughout the film, you see that Andy will take risks. He endures harsh treatment. He starts a library. He teaches people to read. And then slowly and agonizingly, over 19 years, he digs himself to freedom with only a small rock hammer that he hides in his Bible in his room. For Andy, hope for the future creates belief, and belief creates motivation, and motivation creates action. And over the course of the film, he, trains, he changes the perspective of his great friend, his fellow inmate, Red. At the start of the film, Red is cynical. He's resigned to his fate within the walls of the prison. But by the end, he's filled with anticipation of something better, something more wonderful, a hope for the future which enables him to embrace life in the present. If you've been with us over the last couple of weeks, you'll know that the letter to the Hebrews that we're looking at is written to Christians who were finding following Jesus hard, and they were drifting from the gospel at risk of turning away from Christ. And one of the reasons for that, it seems, is that they had started to forget all that God had promised them for the future. Their hope was beginning to wane. Their present life was hard, and they were wondering whether God had forgotten them, whether his promises would really come to pass. They were questioning whether it was really worth following Christ. Spiritually speaking, they'd become a little bit like red in Shawshank Prison bereft of hope. And maybe you feel like that yourself today. The Bible tells us that the present Christian experience as we live in a fallen world will be hard, not least as we take up our cross and follow Christ. And if we're not going to drift from Jesus, it's absolutely vital that we have a clear grasp of where it is that we are going, a clear sense of our destiny, a clear vision of our hope for the future. And that is exactly what the passage today gives us from Hebrews. And it summons us, each of us, to pay the most careful attention to it. What we're going to see, actually, is that the hope that the Bible holds out for us is far more wonderful than the hope that Andy and Red share in the Shawshank Redemption, because it's not just for this life, but for eternity, for beyond death. And so our passage holds before us our great hope, our our destiny. But it does so by telling us a story. And in fact, it tells us the story of the whole Bible, the story of the whole of history in just five verses. And it has three parts. And the first is that it begins with a promise. So just look down at verse 5. So here's the promise that human beings will rule creation. So if you look at verse 5, I'm just going to read from there. It is not to the angels that he, that is God, has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, and then he quotes Psalm 8. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. So you see in verse 5, we're introduced to this idea of a world to come. And it might sound like quite a strange phrase to our ears. But it's simply Hebrews' way of speaking about the new creation, the new world that God has promised to bring at the end of time. And certainly it will come in its fullness at the end of time when Jesus returns. But actually Hebrews tells us that it has broken into the present in the first coming of Jesus. It has already been inaugurated. And if we trust in Jesus, we're already part of that world. The world of salvation, Hebrews 2, verse 3. God has promised his people a brand new home, a perfect creation. But notice, it's not just the place that the writer is concerned with here, 
But actually, with whom is going to whom God has subjected this world to rule? That is what the idea of subjection means. It means who is going to rule? Who is going to have dominion? Who is going to be king of this new world? Well, it's clearly not the angels who we were introduced to last week. But then who is it? Do you notice that the passage doesn't actually immediately tell us? But it's clear that he means that human beings will rule this world. God's people will rule the new creation. Because he immediately cites from a very famous Old Testament text, which is Psalm 8. And if you go back and read that psalm tonight, you'll see that that psalm celebrates the wonder of the privilege that people have at the center of God's creation. God creates the whole world, and he puts human beings right at the heart. As insignificant and as frail as people seem, God has made them kings and queens of his world to rule it, to steward it, to govern it on his behalf. Do you see verse 7? He's made them just a little lower than the angels. But he's crowned them with glory and honor. These words, Psalm 8, reflect on Adam and Eve's creation in God's image from Genesis chapter 1, where they're given a commission to care for God's world, to, to bring order to it, to develop it, to lead it into peace and blessing as they rule under God as his vice regents or his deputies and that was God's original design for the world that was how the order was supposed to work with God there, human beings here creation here we'll see in a moment that the perfect order has been disrupted by human sin that order has been reversed we no longer rule in glory as Psalm 8 celebrates But the point here is Hebrews says that that original order that Psalm 8 celebrates will one day be restored in the future and it will be restored in the world to come. God will again put human beings back as kings and queens of his world. And he will restore his world so that it is perfect and it is right. And if we're followers of Jesus this evening, that is our hope, that is our destiny. That is what we are waiting for and longing for. And you see how much more wonderful that is than many people think the Christian hope is. Maybe you're not a Christian here tonight and you've got this idea that what Christians hope for is to, to be disembodied floating around on the clouds playing harps for all eternity. Let me tell you, that is not what we're going to be doing. That is not what the Bible promises. And it would be awful if it was. What we're promised is nothing less than a perfected world. Not less than this world, but this world put right, as it was always meant to be. It is hard for us to imagine what that will be like, given that we live in a world that is spoilt by sin. But actually, C.S. Lewis brilliantly captures that for us in what it will be like in the last battle, the very last um, book in the Chronicles of Narnia. As that story concludes, the children are taken to their true home, to the new Narnia. And Lord Diggory says to Lucy, you need not mourn over the old Narnia, Lucy. All of the old Narnia that mattered, all the dear creatures have been drawn into the real Narnia. And Lewis goes on and writes, the new Narnia was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. I can't describe it better than that. If you ever get there, you will know what I mean. And it was Unicorn who summed it up, what everyone was feeling. He cried, I've come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all of my life, though I never knew it till now. The reason we loved the old Narnia is that it sometimes looked like this. That is our hope. That is what the Bible promises. That is our destiny if we trust Jesus. So that is the promise. That's the first part of the story, that human beings will rule creation. But notice as the the passage goes on, we come to the second stage in the story, and we hit a problem. And that problem is that we do not see human beings ruling. So just after that Old Testament quotation in verse 8, notice how the, the writer underscores how universal 
and total and perfect human rule is meant to be in the new world. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Do you notice there's a double negative there, which doesn't really work in English. But he left nothing that is not subject to them. To underscore the point that there is to be nothing that is outside human dominion. There is to be nothing that is meant to threaten or contest or undermine their kingly rule. Nothing is intended to bring pain or sorrow. Creation is supposed to be a place of joy and celebration where human beings flourish and where the world flourishes with them. And the point is that one day it will be like that. But of course that is the problem which the verse of, end of verse 8 acknowledges. That God has promised so much, but did you see it? Yet at present we do not see everything subject to them. We don't see the promise fulfilled. The writer says, just look around at the world. And rather than blessing and justice, what we see are conflict and wars and fear and another crisis on the horizon. We look at our lives and we see sin and brokenness spoiling our relationships. We're we're frustrated in our work often. We struggle with illness and sometimes there's no explanation for it. We too often live with fears and anxieties. And in fact, the sign above all that humanity does not rule the world is the reality and presence of death. Human beings are not meant to die. We're meant to reign in life. And even if we are one of the few who will actually enjoy this world for the course of our lives, or we're sheltered for many of the the things that afflict it and spoil it, Actually, one thing is certain, and that is that death will touch us all. None of us can escape it. And of course, we, there are many wonderful things in this world to celebrate and enjoy. We can enjoy a beautiful sunset. We can enjoy a refreshing holiday by the sea. We enjoy life-giving friendships and hobbies. We enjoy family meals or film nights. We enjoy the birth of a baby. We enjoy successes in life and work. We celebrate the wonder of medical advances We can drink a beautiful cup of coffee that's been freshly brewed and ground. But at the same time, we know that the world is not as it is meant to be. It is fractured and spoilt. Life, in many ways, is cursed. It's under the shadow of death. And actually, the Bible explains why this is the case. And the reason is it's because of human sin. If you go back to Genesis, you see that the world that Adam and Eve, the first human beings, are created to to steward and care for is a place of blessing and joy. But what happens is, is that they refuse to obey God. They refuse to listen to him. They refuse to depend on him and they turn from him. And as a result, the creation order is turned upside down. We do not see all things subject to humanity because sin has ruptured our relationship with God. And as a result, our relationship with creation has been ruptured as well. If you read Genesis 3, you see that God places the world under a curse because of sin. So that creation now no longer bows to human rule but actually thwarts it and brings pain and frustration and ultimately death. All of this is part of the penalty for human sin, the expression of God's just wrath, his holy aversion to human sin. The wonder is, according to Hebrews and the rest of the Bible, is that God has promised to put this right in a new world. But just here in this verse that we're looking at, the point he wants to make is that we're still awaiting the fulfillment of that promise. We are still living in a fractured and broken world. There is, in other words, a a tension between what God has promised us and what we experience. And it's vital for us to grasp for our discipleship. There are so many joys of being a Christian. The blessing of the Spirit living in our hearts, the forgiveness of sins. We're going to see more of these things next week. But most of the blessings of the Christian life we don't experience now. We will experience them in the future when Jesus returns and puts the world right. 
It's like we are a young heir or heiress. And we're not yet of age, but we are destined to inherit a great estate and a great title, a great land, and all of the privilege that will come with it. And it's sure and it's certain, and there's no doubt that we'll possess it. But actually, we are not of age yet. The promise has not been fulfilled. We have not yet inherited what has been promised to us. Presently, we do not enjoy it. And that is the point that the writer is trying to make. He's just acknowledging with his readers, empathizing with them, given their experience, that in this life we are not going to experience that until Jesus returns. We live in hope. We live by faith. We must press on. We know that this is no vain hope. Did you see in verse 6, This is all based on God's promise. We don't yet experience it, but it is based on God's promise. Do you notice in verse 6, there's a place where someone has testified, and it's not that he's forgotten who wrote the psalm, but what he's trying to do is draw our attention to the ultimate author of Scripture, that is God. And God has testified, God has sworn, God has promised, and God cannot lie or break a promise that human beings one day will rule over a perfected world. But in fact, actually, we can say more than that. That actually that promise has been, in a sense, enacted. It has actually already been fulfilled in part. It has actually been guaranteed for you and me. And this is the third part of the story in verse 9, where we come to the pledge. Not only has God promised something to us, but he has acted to fulfill it because we do see Jesus ruling for us. Just look at verse 9. While we don't see all things subject to them, we do see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. In other words, we do see one human being, one who was lower than the angels for a while, now crowned with glory and honor, just as Psalm 8 promises. We do see Jesus, who has entered the new world, the new creation, the world to come. We do see Jesus who rules over it in glory as God intends. And we don't see it with our physical eyes. We can't see it as we look around right now. But we do see it with the eyes of faith, through what we have heard, through what God has spoken to us in the Bible about his Son. And it's there as we read the Bible, as we listen to what the the apostles who saw Jesus and knew him have written. It's there that we see and that we learn that Jesus Christ, who died on a cross and who became a man, is now exalted to God's right hand in heaven, fulfilling human destiny. And if you've been with us, you'll know that Hebrews 1 has actually been building to this whole point all throughout. There's a special emphasis in the first chapter on Jesus' exaltation, his ascension to heaven when he went back to his father. Though son of God, he became lower than the angels for a time when he became a man. But he is now enthroned above the angels in the heavenly realm. Hebrews says, chapter 1, verse 2, that he is the heir of all things. He has inherited creation and he rules it now. He was installed as the king of all things He is even, verse uh, chapter 1, verse 6, the firstborn from the dead, the one who has been raised from the dead and now reigns over it, who's triumphed over it. He is the true human being that Psalm 8 always promised would rule creation. Not only has God promised that human beings will rule the world, but he has actually fulfilled that promise in his son, Jesus Christ. And the remarkable thing is, is that Jesus does not just fulfill that promise for himself, But he fulfills it for many brothers and sisters. Chapter 2, verse 10. He fulfills it for us on our behalf. In our country, we have a parliamentary democracy. We elect people, MPs, who will act in Parliament on our behalf. They go to Westminster because we can't. And that is exactly what Jesus has done for us in the present. He has gone to heaven for us. He has fulfilled the psalm for us. He has been crowned with glory and honor on our behalf. And one day we will join him. 
You see, just as Adam and Eve represented humanity in the Garden of Eden when he sinned, when they sinned and they plunged the world into sin and into death, so Jesus has faithfully obeyed God. Even up to the point of death, verse 9, where you see that he was crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. He fulfills our vocation, and now as heir, he will share his rule with us. So in him we see our destiny. We will be where he is. And he right now is, in, is drawing us after him. We're caught up in his wake. And you see, it gets even more incredible than that. It's not only that we can be sure of our destiny, because Jesus acts as our representative in heaven, but also we can be sure that our past has been cancelled because he acts as our substitute on earth. Did you see how the verse ends, verse 9? He was crowned with glory and honour because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for all. What thwarts human rule, what thwarts this creation is our sin and the death that it brings. And you see that Jesus came into the world to taste death for everyone, for everyone who would trust in him. As he died on the cross, he took the penalty for our sin upon himself. He bore the curse for sin in his body. He was cut off from his father in our place so that we would never have to be. And so not only do we have a pledge of a future exaltation, but we have a pledge that we will never be held accountable for our sins. So that when we die or when Jesus returns, we will meet him face to face and we will be welcomed into eternity. Uh, the Shawshank Redemption closes with a very moving scene and I'm going to spoil the film for you if you've not seen it, I'm afraid. We have a recently released Red. He's, he's been released from prison. <clears throat> and he's hoping to be reunited with Andy, who has escaped. And Red is now a changed man, where once he said hope is a dangerous thing, his final words of the film are these. I find myself so excited I can barely sit still. It's the excitement only a free man at the start of a long journey whose conclusion is uncertain can feel. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it was in my dreams. I hope. And you see, we can actually be more excited than red. Because not only have we been freed from our sins so that our past is dealt with, but actually our hope for the future is secure and certain. It's obvious given the trajectory of the film that red will be reunited with Andy, that his hope will be realized. But actually, in the Shawshank Redemption, hope is nothing more, really, than a kind of forced optimism, a sort of wishful thinking of something being better. But actually, we know, because of the pledge of Jesus Christ in heaven, that our future is secure. We're just waiting for him to return. And so Hebrews wants us to understand that God has in store for us a wonderful future, a wonderful destiny, a glorious hope. And it is nothing less than a share in the rule over a restored world under God. And while we don't at present experience it, we know it is secure. That is our destiny. That is our hope. And we're nearly there. But if we're going to endure as Christians, when life is hard, as life inevitably will be from time to time, we need to do what Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 tells us, which is that we need to pay the most careful attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. The danger is when life gets difficult that we take our eyes off the goal, we forget it, we lose sight of God's promise, we lose sight of where Jesus is, and that is a danger that we will drift away. And so what the writer wants us to do this evening, this week, is to keep thinking about Jesus, to fix our eyes on him and where he is, to keep dwelling on our hope, what has been promised to us. And there are so many ways that we can do that. We, as Mark said, we keep meeting together to encourage each other. 
But also we just need to keep our Bibles open before us because that is where we meet Jesus. And there's no great secret to that. If you have trouble reading your own Bible, as often it is for every Christian, then we've got resources that can help you to do that. We, we've just revamped uh, this card, which is, uh, uh, helps you pray. It's got some resources for Bible reading as well. shows you how you might go about reading the Bible for yourself each day. There are copies at the back. You can also access it online. That would be a wonderful thing to take away with you. But also you could... Another way that you could get the Bible into you to to focus your mind and heart on Jesus is this week just to take some of the verses from Hebrews chapter 1 or the verses we've read today and meditate on them, think on them, read on them, reflect on them. Pray that God would open your eyes to see the hope to which he has called you. Why don't I pray? Father, we thank you for this glorious passage of scripture that fixes our eyes on Jesus. Thank you that you have promised us a great destiny. And thank you that though often life is hard in this world, thank you that that promise is secure and certain because we do see Jesus. We pray that you would help us to press on and to look forward to that day when we will meet him face to face. Amen.